please join us in welcoming back to Malukulo Lale, Mr. Bakarana Williams. Aloha mai kāko. Aloha. E malahini wao, i ki ia wahi o lahaina, ja? i ka mokou puni o wa o, 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 o Maui, i koho wa i pai aina, no laila, o hoomaka wao e uh, me ko kuu ho, mooku ma, 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 ma. I'm going to start with my genealogy, yeah? uh, as my kumu taught me. So I'm Ron Williams Jr. Uh, there's a Ron Williams Sr., my dad. He lives in Arkansas, he comes from a long line of farmers, fishermen, hunters in Arkansas. My mother is Janet Marie Labounty. Her people come from Chicago, which is where I was born. Uh, and then before that, back through Montreal, and, bit, and before that, France and Ireland, which I'm wearing my St. Patrick's Day socks today, so we're good. <laughs> it's not just Kawaiiole Day. Okay, so um, that's, I, I come from a background of Irish, of English, of French, and of farmers from Arkansas. Um, the, my academic mo'okuaoha is a little more complicated. Um, I went to college in 1984 uh, at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. By the way, we were national champions in football that year. <laughs> Not many people can say that. Um, and I was there for a year and a half, and I took about 16 classes, I think, and I passed one of them. And the school and I both agreed I should try something else. <laughs> and so I went home, um, and I came out to Maui in 1997. Uh, actually, New Year's Day, 1997, is when I arrived in Maui. <clears throat> I had the very, very fortunate uh, happening of meeting my first kumu, and that was a Kona. Um, for some reason, he picked me out and, and took me under his wing, gave me a word or two every day, gave me a little bit of stuff to follow, uh, and eventually, I was working for him on those Maui Nate tours and, and getting more and more interested. Now, when I arrived here, I knew that I was visiting somebody else's place. That was obvious to me, um, and I was interested. But what he did is kind of slow me down and to have me start to begin to understand the tip of that kuleana. Yeah? My daughter was three years old at the time. I was working at the Feast at Lele. I was one of the waiters there at the Feast at Lele, having a blast. Um, wearing lava lava, watching the surf sunset every night, making good money, eating poi, mohole fern. And it hit me one day that I couldn't work at the luau forever, because no one wants to see a 60-year-old with his shirt off. <laughs> So I decided to go back to school. And so I went to Maui Community College, and that's where I had my second great fortune, and that was to meet my kumu, Kiopi Raymond. Uh, Kiopi was my kumu in Hawaiian Studies 107 and Hawaiian language, and he showed a film in class one day that changed my life, quite literally. And that was a film that I watched of the most passionate, fierce, amazing person I'd ever met in my life, and that was Dr. Kaunani K. Trask. Um, Dr. Trask uh, lit a fire in me, and I said, you know, not knowing any better, being naive, I said, well, I want to go study under her. And so, the Rainbow Bridge program that brought us out to University of Hawaii, I took that and went out to Kamakakuo Kalani. I was welcomed with open arms by Mehana Hind, who was the counselor at the time, uh, and she kind of pulled me aside. It was a, a group of folks and, and me, and, and, and she said, if you choose to come here to Kamakakuo Kalani, then this is your home too. And so I was welcomed there at Kamakaku. Um, I brought my daughter with me. I was a single dad at the time. And I got my bachelor's degree in 2005 in Hawaiian studies. I got my master's degree in Pacific Island studies in 2008. And I got my PhD in Hawaiian history in 2013. Now the thing that's, that I think is important to note about that PhD, not, not mine, but the PhD in general, is they just started that program about six years ago. And think about that tonight when we talk about place and so forth. For 100 years, the University of Hawaii existed without a PhD in Hawaiian history. You could get a PhD in Pacific history and focus on Hawaii, but it was Pacific history. You could get a PhD in Korean history, in Southeast Asian history, in French history, in American history. But they just started a program that's a PhD in Hawaiian history. There's two professors, Dr. Arista and Dr. Rosa, that run that program now. And so now students are starting to filter into that program focusing on Hawaii. Yeah? So that's my academic mo'okuelhao, my academic genealogy. Um, I also want to thank uh, a few folks to, to start off. Um, number one, the, I, the, the folks at Lahaina Restoration Foundation that not only planned and thought this up, but pulled it off. Um, this is pretty amazing, uh, what's happened here tonight. And so I thank them. Um, Anohea wrote, read a quote about, uh, about justice and things like that. 
that's why I'm here. Um, I've been giving talks for quite a while now and I've, and I've, and I've worked on my PhD and, and, and talked about my PhD for quite a few times. And what I've realized is it's not about that, it's not about winning anything. It's not about convincing you of anything. It's about putting forth the voices of the Kapuna, the voices of the past, so that you can know more about yourself and your people and other people. So that we can all start to build towards a future that we all know, right? Because quite honestly, we know very little, including myself. Um, I'm gonna talk tonight about a couple of topics. Uh, the major topic is Kawikioli. But I don't do any talks nowadays without starting with historiography. Yeah? Historiography is just the fancy term for the, the creation of history, the process, yeah? Um, there's history books. I've got a couple here. This is a history book. The way this person came up with their history is their historiography. Yeah? Who they talk to? Now, every history book ever written in history is exclusive. It can't include everyone. You're going to do a history book on World War II? You're going to talk to 40 million people? Of course not. You know? You're going to talk to some people. And the, that, those choices that you make create your historiography. Now, you might try as hard as you can to be inclusive, and that's a good thing. But it's still a little bit exclusive. Sometimes people are purposefully exclusive. That's the case for Hawaiian history. We all know the contested history. We all know the facts, uh, basic facts about what has happened here. Dr. Trask used to say it's been done a thousand times. They perfected it by now. The first thing you do is get rid of a people's language. And that was done. And the history that we have about Hawaii today, even folks, good folks that are putting out histories today, come from a process, a foundation that was eternally scarred and, and, and messed up, yeah? And that's what I'm gonna talk about first and then we'll get into actually the, the, the facts of Kaui Kioli, okay? Um, the other thing besides Mo'oko Ahau that, that I've always been trained to talk about it to start with is place, yeah? Um, this place that we're at, King Kamehameha III School, is quite appropriate. Um, I gave a talk yesterday at the state capitol. Yesterday was the 50th anniversary of the state capitol building. And I gave a talk on ancient capital. So we talked about Mo'oko'ula and Lahaina. And it was wonderful, but it felt kind of odd. I'm like, I should be in Lahaina talking about Lahaina. <laughs> but, but so, thank goodness that you guys invited me here and I'm, and I'm honored to be here. But let's talk a little bit about this place that we're at right here. Um, it post-dates Kawikioli by a little bit, the story I'm gonna tell you, but that is, but it's just because it's, it's just, he, he, he started this process and that was the creation of a school, right? Just on the other side of us here. And that school was called Kalua Ehu. Yeah, and I'm gonna show you a photograph. Right here. Okay, and so if you look right there, that's Lua Ehu School, right? There's Canal Street, there's Front Street, yeah. Lua Ehu School. So what was Lua Ehu? Lua Ehu, besides being the place name for the Constitution and so forth, was a school started by Alexander Liho Liho and Queen Emma. Yeah. Now, the school was very, very purposeful. Most of you know the fact that Queen Emma brought the Anglican Church to Hawaii. And that was a contestation of the American mission. Yeah? American mission had the school up on the hill, behind Luna. It had been 20 or 30 years. Um, some of the elite didn't like the way they were kind of pushing themselves into certain areas and, and making demands and so forth. So Queen Emma, who was part British, and her husband started looking for maybe there's another answer. So the Anglican Church came to Hawaii. And as soon as they arrived, the Queen insisted that they incorporate. And they did. We have those incorporation papers at the State Archives. They incorporated it as the um, uh, Reformed Catholic Church. And it was in 1862. And so they start this church, and the queen says, because you've incorporated I can give you land and property and money. And she did. And they started a school. Now, we all know about the school over in Oahu, but it actually all started here in Lahaina. The first school built, the Anglican school built, was on these premises. And it was called Lua Ehu. And it was a direct contestation of Lahaina Luna. In fact, in the Board of Education reports, they, it's named Lahaina Lalo. Yeah. So Lahaina Luna, Lahaina Lalo. And something super interesting, the Queen insisted, now they were doing the same thing as, that was being done up at Lahaina Luna. They were educating the future native leaders of Hawaii. Yeah. Curtis Iaokea went here. William Punahu Aveoveo Ulukalani White went here. Yeah. Future leaders of Hawaii are being trained in geometry and math and science and all these things at Lua Ehu School, and she insisted that they be taught in English. Now, that's, it's, 
hard to, you know, sometimes we have this impulse that, well, English good, or bad, or Hawaiian good, and so forth. But remember that in 1862, no one thought the language was going away. To learn English meant that you were bilingual. Bilingual, which meant that you were at least equal. Now, up at Lahaina Luna, they're teaching them in, in Hawaiian, but they're graduating with a single language, some of them. Some of them were bilingual. But she insisted, I want these students to, to be fluent in Hawaiian, fluent in English, and have all the schooling that Lahaina Luna is getting. And that school, Lua'ehu, existed on this premises. Right? So it was a contestation of the Protestant mission that came out of Kawikioli's push for a literate nation. Right? They started to develop. So that's the place we're at today. Okay? Now let's start off by looking at some images. So I thought it might be, now those of you who know me know that I can get kind of uh, zealous in my research. So I've got material to keep you here till morning. <laughs> but, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, yeah. But I do want to show you, I thought it might be fun or interesting to go through the images of Kawikioli that we have and tell you where they're from and who has them and those types of things. But 10 minutes, so let's do that. Okay, so. Let's start off with this one. Okay, now this well-known painting is by Robert Dampierre. This was the painting that was, that was the side painting of the Nahiena Anna painting. It was when the ship arrived, bringing back the bodies of Kamehameha II, right, and his wife. Um, it's held at the Honolulu, Honolulu Museum of Art. And I, I wanna, this is being taped, isn't it? <laughs> Crud. But who cares? Uh, so, I, I, you know what, and, and I, should, I should preface this by saying, I joke around, but, but I do want to say something, because it is important. It is important to get these facts right. And we've had time enough to be, to, 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 we've all heard that we should be doing our research and so forth. So, I'll, I'll tell the story. <laughs> Honolulu Museum of Art holds this painting and the other one. They had them in the Holt Galleries for, for a decade or so. I went up there about 10 years ago, and I'm going up to the, and I wanted to check out the originals. And I go up, and they have the Kawikioli, and underneath they have the card that tells you all about him, and it says, Kawikioli, Kamehameha III, son of Kamehameha II. And I'm like, and it, you know, and it's, and, it, and with all due respect, that's something you could have found on Wikipedia, right? Or, or make a call or something. But, it, but it, and I, I mention that because it speaks to the comfort, the comfort that folks have with guessing about Hawaiian history. Yeah, I'm gonna show you some other stuff in a few minutes, but that's how normalized it has become to do research in English, to assume that, call somebody at the university and they know or something, right? The, the facts are all there, but we're, we're taking the lazy way out. Now, back to the painting. <laughs> Kawikioli, uh, he was 11 years old at the time. Um, he becomes Mo'i at that time, but yet with a kind of asterisk, um, because he's, he is 11, he's not of age yet. Uh, the person with the power really is Ka'ahumanu at that time, who was the Kohina Nui. But this painting was made of him, and, and it's an oil on canvas, 20 by 24, Honolulu Museum of Art. It was given to the, that museum by the Cook family. Okay? Ooh, I've got a clicker I can use. Uh, this is a painting that the Hawaii State Archives has. It is of Kawikioli um, in a Prussian army uniform that he was gifted. Yeah? Uh, and it's circa 1831, oil on canvas, 36 by 28 inches, and again, it is at the Hawaii State Archives. Well, interesting fact, many of, the many of the artifacts that are held by folks like the Palace and so forth are actually property of the State Archives. Um, I say State Archives, it's really a public archives, right? Uh, it comes from the Kingdom era, but this is State Archives material. This painting was actually discovered about 10, 12 years ago. Um, not a lot of images of Nahiana Anna, and Kawikioli, but this one was discovered in Australia. A private owner had it, didn't really know about it, didn't know much about it. Uh, um, David Forbes and some other folks had come across it, told him what it was. Uh, there were five paintings of Ali, and three of them were bought by Bishop Museum, two of them were bought by the Honolulu Museum of Art, so they are, they are split up. But this one of Kawikioli is at the Bishop Museum. And it was in 1836 uh, when a French ship came to Hawaii and the painter painted Kawaikioli. Okay, this is a colored pencil watercolor and ink drawing, six by eight inches. This one's held by the Smithsonian. Yeah. Uh, it was in, he was the artist aboard the US Navy exploring expedition, the Wilkes expedition, when it came to Hawaii. So you have that, and you also have a rough draft of it here, right? Another six by eight inch uh, painting, or drawing. Then we get into the photography, daguerreotypes. Um, now, daguerreotypes, are, there's one of each, right? There's no negative, so you're making a photograph, and that's it. 
Sometimes they would take two or three in a row, so they look kind of similar. This was an unknown photographer. It's uh, Kamehameha III and Queen Kalama, and that's a actually photograph. Yeah? Uh, this daguerreotype that's kind of semi-famous is held by the Bishop Museum. Uh, the Kamehameha Royal Family, the Hugo Stregenwald, um, again, Bishop Museum. This was fascinating. This, this I found upstairs at the Hawaii State Archives. This is a bracelet, a gold bracelet, with a diamond inlay that is a daguerreotype of the royal family once again. It's the same image you saw before, but a different, you know, might have been taken five seconds later or whatever, but it's the same type of image, and it's inside that locket. It's believed to be, be the, the bracelet of Queen Emma, I'm mean, sorry, Princess Ruth, Princess Ruth. Yeah. And then finally, I think this daguerreotype uh, of Koikioli from, from Stagenwald again. This is circa 1853, so this would have been the year before he passed. And then this one, which is privately owned, uh, is circa 1853 also. So those are the major images that we have of Kawikioli. Um, the statue that went up, I thought it was interesting, the statue that went up in Thomas Square Park recently. Um, some of my dear friends who, who uh, kind of jump, look for things to criticize, um, didn't like the statue because it didn't look like him, they said. I was like, well, you think the Kamehameha one statue looks like him? <laughs> Like, you know, so there's, you know, there's, at least we have photographs now of Kawikioli, we can look at it. Okay, so let's look into the talk. So, I want to start off, okay. I want to start off with that issue of historiography. Now, um, there's master narratives about everybody and every place, right? If they're semi-famous. Um, we all carry those master narratives, I promise you. They are within all of our heads. If I forced you, I'm going to pick on you. If I forced you to tell me about, so tell me a couple of things about uh, the Congo in Africa. You have to. You, I have a gun to your head saying you have to say something. What do, what do you know? What, what are you going to tell me about the Congo? Tarzan. <laughs> Tarzan. What does it look like? Waterfalls, jungle. Okay. Uh, barren, lots of people, mil hill, mountains. Mountains. Okay. Okay. So now thank you so much. But my point is, we all carry narratives about places, places we probably have never been. You've never been to the Congo? Okay. If somebody forced me to talk about Australia and said, you've got to do it and pretend like you know, I'd talk for half an hour about Australia. Because I've read stuff, and I've seen stuff on TV, and I've seen after school specials and so forth and so forth. Those are the master narratives. How those master narratives are created is vitally important, okay? The master narrative for Hawaii 95% of what you've ever read about Hawaii has come from English language sources. Now that doesn't mean every pit was a lie, but it means that everything you know about Hawaii from that 95% comes from ship captains, businessmen, ship captains' wives, missionaries' wives, and so forth. Hawaiians spoke and wrote prolifically. One of the most literate nations in the world produced one of the largest archives of indigenous writing in the world. We have 125,000 pages of Hawaiian language newspapers. And everyone focuses on the newspapers, and that's great, I'm, I'm glad, that's awesome. But people forget, we've got tens of thousands of Hawaiian language letters, correspondences, from the elite back and forth, from the maka'ainana to the elite. We've got petitions, we've got bills, we've got laws, we've got government documents. I was, I'm going through stuff at the archives recently. Sheriff, the sheriffs, when they're writing in what's going on in 1892, 93, 94, they're writing maka'ulala Hawaii. Yeah, because the head attorney general spoke both English and Hawaiian. So we have these documents, a prolific archive of Hawaiian language documents that was put away and set over there. And they wrote Hawaiian history from this. I'm going to give you an analogy. Um, say we're creating a history of America, the United States. And we're, it's going to be the history book, the, you know, the, the main history book about America. And so we want to get the best historian out there, so we hire the best historian in the world. He's this Italian guy, very famous. You know, he goes to, he goes to Oxford, da, 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 and we say, we've come write the history of America. He says, okay, I'm, I'm good at what I do, I can do this. So he comes to the National Archives, and in the National Archives, there are five billion documents. And he comes up to the front desk, he doesn't speak English, he speaks Italian. So he comes up to the front desk and he says to the lady, she has an interpreter, and he says, give me everything you've got in there that's written in Italian, <laughs> right? And it, the Italian Americans who were living in America had written, and, and so he goes in that five billion dollar or five billion document warehouse, and they pull out five thousand documents and they hand them to him. And he walks out and he sits down and he spends ten years and he writes the history of America. 
And that becomes a book, that becomes a textbook, that becomes a history book, that becomes a movie, that becomes an after school special, that becomes you talking to your friend at the water cooler, and that becomes American history. That's what's happened in Hawaii. That's what's happened in Hawaii. The native voices were shut out. All the prolific stuff that we know about Hawaii has come from those singular five or six percent of the population. Yeah? So I'm gonna show you why, why that's important. Um, I usually do this by slideshow, but I've got plenty of pictures tonight, so I'm gonna just talk story about this. Um, in 1893, there was an overthrow, right? A coup. The queen was overthrown. Now, give it a little bit of back context. You have a group of, a small group of men, white men, who had gathered together to overthrow the native monarchy and take over. And they didn't want to take over to rule Hawaii. They wanted to be annexed to the United States immediately. They, they, that was the plan all along. And they, so they didn't think they'd have to worry about much. We'll just do this and get annexed. But there's a problem because there's a pause and so forth and so forth. So, so they have to make an argument for why they've just done this. Now, as much as we like to generalize everybody, including America, there was a very strong anti-imperialism movement going on in America. There were many folks in America who thought this wasn't a just thing to do. I wrote an article for the Hawaiian Journal of History that talks about collegiate debates over annexation in the US. In 1893 and 1894, and I found this in the Hawaiian language newspaper, they were talking about a debate at Georgetown about Hawaiian annexation, and the no side won. So I started following other universities across the country, and I found seven different debates in 1893 and 1894 where the collegiate teams debated annexation. In every case, the no side won for two reasons. Actually, so it was, it was Harvard, Yale, Georgetown, Columbia. Uh, the other one that I thought was interesting was uh, Stanford UC schools. Stanford was one year as old, and the UC schools were Hastings Law School and Berkeley. And they debated, should we annex Hawaii? One argument was racist. We don't want 100,000 brown people coming into our country as citizens. <laughs> but the other argument was it's not just. It's not right. Yeah? We're of the people, by the people, and for the people. How can you make an argument that a population of two or 3,000 white folks should run a country of 115,000 people? So, it's, it, so they're kind of stuck. What, what argument do we make? Now, in 1863, the ABC FM in Boston had declared Hawaii a Christian nation. And they said, they are a Christian, civilized, intelligent people. In 1863, now 40 years later, those sons and grandsons of the mission have to make a different argument. If they're intelligent and civilized and Christian, then why are we running the country and not them? So the thing they come up with is that old argument about race and civilization and da 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 and da da da. And they start to wipe out that past 50 years of accomplishment in the kingdom and write a new history. In 1893, in, two weeks after the overthrow, they get uh, William DeWitt Alexander to write a pamphlet about the overthrow, this thing that has just happened. Because they gotta come up, they gotta make up some kind of story. And so he writes this pamphlet called The Overthrow, and they sell it from the Pacific Commercial Advertiser. Later on, you know, you know that there was no annexation in 93, the Republic was declared, so forth, and pause, pause, pause. Now a push for annexation comes up again in 1898. Because of the Spanish-American War, America takes Hawaii and so forth. Now, how do we, Again, how do we cover our tracks? How do we make sure that what we did looks good to folks in the US? And so that pamphlet turns into a book. And that book is right here. This is A Brief History of the Hawaiian People by W.D. Alexander, William DeWitt Alexander. Not only was he the most prominent Hawaii historian of the time, but he was the president of the Board of Education. This book is a horrible book. If you read through it, it's racist, it's Hawaiians aren't really human, they can't run the place, blah, 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 blah. Horrible. But I want to read you one most, uh, kind of the most egregious part of it. And I apologize, for, you know, some of this stuff is, is very kamaha, yeah? But I do believe we have to know where we got the stuff we have to be able to get rid of it. So here's what W.D. Alexander writes in his book about infanticide. Infanticide is the killing of your own children, right? Uh, Dr. Stannard and others have disproven that, that, that myth of widespread infanticide. Nonetheless, um, he writes, William DeWitt Alexander writes here on page 33, infanticide. Infanticide was fearfully prevalent, and there were few of the older women at the date of the abolition of idolatry who had not been guilty of it. It was the opinion of those best informed that two-thirds of all children born in Hawaii were destroyed in infancy by their parents. They were generally buried alive, in many cases, in the very houses occupied by their unnatural parents. The principal reason given for it was laziness, unwillingness to take the trouble of rearing children. 
So William DeWitt Alexander says that two-thirds of Native Hawaiian children were buried alive in the front yard because parents didn't want to raise them. Right? Now we know that's ridiculous. We know that's awful and racist and so forth. But he's been dead 200 years, who cares? I care because this book became the territorial textbook for all schools in Hawaii for 40 years. This was the book used in every public and private school in the territory of Hawaii from 1899 to 1939. So you wonder why the, some, you know, your grandfather, great-grandfather, great-grandmother have a, you know, got the different, a, a different story. This is what it said, right? They were raised for two or three generations saying, this is your ancestors, right? That's why it's important. Now, I did, a, I did my MA in, in, on history of Hawaii and historiography and stuff, and one of my committee members said, well, yeah, that's great, but you know, that's, that's old stuff. That doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> it does happen. It happens constantly. Uh, here's a book that came out about five years ago. The president of the University of Hawaii decided he wanted a history of the university. So he tasked each department to write a history of their department. Most of the departments ignored him, like they usually do. But uh, tropical ag took it up in style because that's where we came from. We all came from, it was a tropical agriculture school that became the University of Hawaii, that became Manoa. So they said, oh great, we get to show up. You know, so, so they put out this coffee table book, this huge, beautiful, very expensive coffee table book about the history of UH, all started with, with tropical ag, okay? And so I got it, I'm like, I just found this a couple years ago and I'm reading it and, and I read through and I kinda need a little help. I need, George, you can help me. I need you, to, I need you to read one sentence, okay? Hold this, please. Hold the mic. Read this sentence that starts with... No, I don't want... I, I don't want I, uh. <laughs> oh, you don't have glasses. Who, who wants to read for me? Do you read, sir? Okay. So read this one sentence, nice and loud, starting with on, just one sentence. Okay. Starting with on. Yeah. Hang on. Huh? It'll be worth it, I promise. Okay, there we go. Sorry, it's dark in here. Okay, so right there, which is on. Point again, I don't see right, it. Right there. Okay. On January 4th, 1893, the Hawaii Bureau, later the Board of Agriculture and Forestry, was established in the Republic of Hawaii, also established in 1893, in parentheses. Okay. So, again, on January 4th, 1893, the Bureau of Tropical Agriculture and Forestry was started in the Republic of Hawaii. Why are you laughing? Huh? The Republic didn't exist until 1894. January 4th, 1893 was two weeks before the overthrow. A Maui senator in the Kingdom Legislature in 1991 pushed a bill to create a tropical agriculture bureau to, to eventually turn into a college. On January 4th, 1893, two weeks before the overthrow, the Queen signed that bill and it became law. And in 2005, you have the University of Hawaii publishing a book saying, no, 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 it was the group of white men who took over who founded our university. Now this is a, this is a, this is a uh, UH Press book with two different editors that went through it. Now, I don't think they, you know, maybe. I don't think they did it purposely. I think it speaks to that idea of this normalization that, of course, the guys who did the overthrow started the university. Of course, that's where education came from. That's where intellect came from. But again, with all due respect, I never go there, but you could go to Wikipedia and find out that's wrong, right? That speaks to the normalization of people making up history without even at the university. So it's not a problem that's 150 years old. It's a problem that's five years old, it's today old, yeah? These histories are, continue to be created and continue to be created without that primary source research. Okay? So that's the bad news. <laughs> Let's talk about the good news. The good news is things are changing. There's a whole generation of students. Um, you know, my daughter went to immersion for 10 years. She, went, she started at Nahiana Anna, immersion up at Nahiana Anna. Um, and she uh, blows me away. She corrects my Hawaiian all the time. <laughs> so so um, folks like her and others. Um, that will read through these papers and read through these documents and start to put out history are changing those things, are challenging those other histories, yeah? So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight when we talk about Kawikioli. And before I get into Kawikioli, I wanna say, I, I wanna kind of give you a feeling for how big the general narrative is messed up. 
Now, much of the stuff I, I'm going to talk about is new research that redefines most of what we know about Kawikioli. I was taught in 2001 at, uh, at Maui Community College. Uh, I had history, history 284 was Hawaiian history, and the textbook was Gavin Dawes is a Shoal of Time. And I was taught that Kawikioli was a drunk, that he partied, that he kind of wasted the kingdom away. They could never get him to do anything. You know, he had to roust him out of bed and just didn't really do anything. He was just around for a long time. Right? And he was heathen, he did all these crazy things and so forth. That's what I was taught about Kawikioli. The true story is quite different. The true story is Kawikioli crafted a nation that saved his people for over 50 years. Now, many scholars, including Dr. Beamer and others, have, have started to show us that this narrative of the fact, it all started back with a, a, a book called Fatal Impact. A Pacific history scholar wrote a book called Fatal Impact. He said, well, basically the story is white folks went throughout the Pacific and native folks fell to the wayside, right? Not what happened. Uh, Hawaiians had agency, had power. Those 13 or 14 folks in Honolulu weren't running everything, right? My dissertation looks at the church, and that, that's a different topic. Um, but what we're coming to understand is that Kawikioli brilliantly set a plan to save the nation and achieved it beyond all, all odds, right? Um, I was taught that uh, the missionaries imposed a Western style of government on Hawaii, and therefore everything was lost. Now think about that. In the 1830s, 1840s, the Pacific was being gobbled up by European powers. The Spanish had already taken the Marquesas. The French were looking at French Polynesia. Germans were looking at Samoa, right? Hawaii couldn't defend itself against navies in the world. Of course not. And Hawaii was strategically probably the most important place, right in the center of the Pacific. The only chance to save Hawaii's independence was to gain recognition as an equal. It's a crazy, crazy story. No way. I mean. How, why would countries recognize Hawaii, this tiny little place Hawaii, as an equal? But it's the only chance he had. So he, and I, as a world historian, world, world history is one of my topics, as a, as a world historian I can tell you, I don't know of another situation where an absolute monarch, a divine monarch, voluntarily gives up significant amounts of his power for his people to save the nation. He didn't have to do that. When prior to the 1840 constitution, Kawikioli was the ruler. He was divine. The 1840 Constitution created three separate parts of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Now, it wasn't wholly separate, because he was parts of the other two also, but the 1852 Constitution completely separated it. So he twice voluntarily gives up power. Why? Not because he was tricked into it by William Richards or anyone else, because he was smart enough to know that's the only way we're going to gain recognition, and it's a shot. So he does that. Later, I'm going to talk about the fact that the, the mission that went out around the world to gain recognition was successful. On November 28th, La Foucault, we celebrate sovereign, the English, English and the French celebrating that, that, that equal status. Hawaii was welcomed into the family of nations, right? And that kept Hawaii safe for 50 years. Yeah. Now, what happened in 1893 was a violation of international law, of treaties, and of all of those things. But those are the things, that recognition by Kawiki, that Kawikili gained was what saved Hawaii for the half a century. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, before I do, and I promise I'm getting into it in a second, but before I do, I want to kind of share with you a narrative of identity. You know, we've talked about identity and how we see ourselves and so forth. Um, besides Kawikioli, I want you to know a couple of things about the kingdom. Um, I work really, really hard at not, uh, on, people who are on my Facebook know, page know because I always kick them off. <laughs> um, I work really, really hard at saying, here's primary sources of history, you go play with it and argue about it and stuff like that. Um, I'm not a political scientist, I'm a historian, right? And I take that very seriously. So when I say these things to you, uh, that I'm about to say, I want you to understand they're coming from me not as a, as a way to get you to believe something, but a way just to share those facts. The Kingdom of Hawaii in the 19th century was one of the most progressive, modern, just nations in the world. That's without question. Now listen to these facts. Those of you who can and want to, I encourage you to close your eyes. You don't have to. When you do, because I, I want you to hear these things, because these aren't the things you've heard from books for the last 50 years. In 1840, Kawikioli voluntarily gave up two thirds of his power to save his nation's independence. In 1843, England and France declare Hawaii a sovereign and equal co-nation into the family of nations. 
No other European-born nation in the world had achieved that. Hawaii was first. Yeah. In 1852, Kawikioli and the other, other elite, you write a constitution that offers universal manhood suffrage. Yeah. Your Kapuna created a nation, a constitution, that said, we don't care what race you are. White, black, German, African, Portuguese, Chinese, Japanese, you can become a citizen, vote, own property, and own a business in Hawaii in 1852. Now that's a decade prior to the US Civil War. What was the US Civil War about? A decade after Hawaii, the Hawaiian nation offered universal manhood suffrage, in America they're fighting about whether or not to own black people. That's a progressive nation. 1860s, we have one of the most literate nations in the world here in Hawaii. By the 1870s, you have 136 consulates, Hawaiian Kingdom consulates around the world. Yes? In 1854, you have Kawikioli declaring neutrality in the Crimean-Russian War, saying we're not going to choose sides, we're, we're, we're a neutral country. And the other country said, what's a neutral country? <laughs> And they got together four years later and they came up with the laws about neutrality for, world, for international relations. That came from Hawaii. That came from Kawikioli's statement. Yeah? In 1890, Hui Kalai Aina pushed to change the constitution to include voting for women. It didn't happen, they didn't have enough votes, but they pushed for it in 1890. In 1894, at the, Repu at the Republic's Constitutional Convention, uh, women once again brought the, the want to vote to the convention. And they literally wrote in their notes at the, the state archives, they said, yeah, you're right, women should be able to vote, but we can't afford to do that here because there's 13 native women for every one white woman. Yeah. Women didn't gain the vote in, under democracy in the United States until 1921, right? So that country, that nation that Kawikioli found, started and built and so forth, that, that Alexander Liho Liho and Lot Kapoiva and Kawikioli and William Charles Lino Lilo kept going, was literally one of the most progressive modern nations in the world. Yeah, that's not the story we got. So let's talk about Kawikioli in particular. Okay. So, Kawikioli, Keaviaviula, Kivalao, O Kawikioli, Kaleo Papa. Yeah? Uh, this was a birth chant printed for him in Kanu Kuokoa, 24 March 1865. O Hanao Kamoku Akapu, right? Pa'a ia leva alani ika lima akau o wakea. Firm in the left hand of wakea, right? So this chant went on, there was 300 lines. <laughs> the chant went on and talked about his birth, yeah, and how important it was. Now let's start to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. So this is, so where did he get his mana? Where did he get the right to rule? Yeah, we don't have a constitution yet. Um, this allows us to talk about things like Kiavahine and Keopulani, right? I was, again, I was taught there were four main deities in Hawaii. Ku, Kane, Lono, Kane, Loa. What does that leave out? The female Akua, yeah? Um, we know Samuel Kamakau taught, called, uh, called Kamehameha the first, Ali'i Lepo Popolo, yeah? We know his genealogy was, even, even with his Popolua genealogy, it, was, it wasn't the highest. He's gonna take over the nation. But when he dies, why are his children going to have the right to rule? Well, it's because he was smart and took Keopualani, right? And her genealogy, her mo'okuaha, her deity, which included Pialani's line, which included Kiavahine. So Kiavahine, right? Kalaahiana, daughter of Pialani, gives Kawikioli and Liholiho the right to rule. Right? Uh, 1821, Ahukuhina, this council of chiefs, gets together, and they've tested out this this literacy the missionaries are bringing. It's about, been about a year now, and they decide, yes, this is good, and we want our first students to learn it. And they say, you're assigned to him, and you're assigned to him, and so forth. Kawikioli and his best buddy friend, as a, as a child, was, was Timoteo Hotlelio. They're assigned to Mr. Brigham, Mr. Bigham, yeah? And that's where they start to learn, and they become some, some of the first uh, literate Native Hawaiians, Kanakaoli. In the state archives, we have about 140 page writ, handwritten uh, minutes of the 1829 council that Kahumanu called together that started the first laws in Hawaii. And we don't know who wrote it, but it looks like it's probably going to be Hot Lulio. Yeah. So, one of the first literate Hawaiians. Uh, on a June 6th, 1825 ceremony, he's proclaimed Mo'i again, as I mentioned, as a kind of a restricted Mo'i. 
uh, upon the bo- return of the body of his elder brother, Liho Liho. Um, 1832, Kawikioli comes of age at the death of Kaahumanu, insists upon his full right to power, and does gain that full right of power. Now, that doesn't mean, remember, there still was a Kohina Nui. There's a new Kohina Nui posted, and they are going to co-sign on different laws and bills and so forth. Um, but he is really kind of now taking his spot uh, in the creation of the kingdom. So Kukulu Apuni, building the nation. Again, uh, 1830s. Um, remember that probably the most visible, probably the most important, the largest issue on everyone's mind is death from disease, right? Tens of thousands of Native Hawaiians dying from deaths of disease. Um, we have Kawikioli, and, I, and there's many, many, many parts to his story that I'm not going to be able to get to because, again, you, you want to be here for just a few hours. <laughs> so... Um, but we, knew, we do need to talk for a moment about that struggle where Kawikili decides, yes, you've got your answer, Jehovah. Um, you know, and some folks are going to take that route. But, but we've been doing this for 2,000 years and it's worked. And so we're going to do this. And that is a Ni'alpio union, right? Between Nahiena and, and originally Liholiho, but eventually Kawikioli. And so here in Lahaina, they start a project to make that happen, to create an akua with that Ni'aupio mating that will be strong enough to solve this problem they've never faced, which is mass death and disease. And so they start to build a pa'u for Nahiana Anna. Those of you who know, most of you probably know, the, the, most of the types of feathers were, were not uh, allowed to women. Uh, they were capes, yeah. But they build this pa'u starting here in Lahaina. And it was a two-year project, and you have this pa'u created. I don't think I have a picture of it. Let me see. No. Um, this at the Bishop Museum today, it contains approximately one million o'o feathers. Now the o'o had eight to twelve yellow feathers on its body. So who's good at math? I'm not. <laughs> it's 150, 175,000 birds, right? This was a national project. This wasn't like let's make her a cape. This was a national project to imbue. Now in my mana'o, this is just this is not fact. This is my mana'o to imbue her mutti. That's why it's a pa'u, right? Her, her ability to procreate, her ability to create this new akua, right? So they build, here in Lahaina, again, they build this, this pa'u. She does wear it a couple of times. She is with her brother, despite the fact that the, the, the missionaries have married her off to somebody else. She is with her brother. Um, we know this for several reasons. One is because there are several accounts of it from ship captain's journals who say, yes, the king and his sister were, were so forth the other day. Well, and he also, at one point, sends out a crier throughout town to announce what's going on. And you have to figure out why, yeah? Because he wants to make sure that when that child is born nine months from now, people know it's his child. It's not the missionary husband's child, right? So they're, you know, Nahiana and the Kawikioli are creating a new, a new, a new king. Um, they do, Nahiana and does have a child September, 20, September 17, 1836. The child last, uh, dies after a few hours. Nahianana dies uh, three months later on December 30th, 1836. Kawikioli is heartbroken. He brings her body back to Haleoluhe, which is downtown Honolulu, kind of near Queens Hospital. Um, and he won't give her up. He won't part with her. And so the papers are writing in every week saying, when's he going to bury her? When's he going to bury her? Um, he has a funeral for her at Kabayaha'o Church on February 4th. Another historiography moment. Um, the English language newspaper that has her funeral has the funeral laid out and it's led by Christian missionaries. And I was like, wow, that's, they, they had that much power back then to lead the funeral of Nahiana Anna? So I go to the Hawaiian language newspaper, which was Kekumu, and it says, Kuhuna la'au la'pa'au, Hawaiian warriors, blah, 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 and missionaries about six or seven. So then I start to put context behind it and say, well, who published that newspaper? Who published this newspaper? And so forth and so forth. The Kekumu, the Hawaiian language newspaper, was written by Reverend Reuben Tinker, who was the man who presided over the funeral for Nahianana. So, I'm, you know. so anyway, that's another note about how these things get, the stories get mixed up. Um, in April, uh, Kawaikioli buys a ship called the Kitote, a Spanish ship called the Kitote. He rechristens it the Harrieta Nahianana. He creates a small armada of ships, and they sail over to Lahaina, Maui, to place, uh, Kawi, to place Nahiana and his body near her mom. Uh, the pathway is written out in the Hawaiian language newspapers in the 1860s. And it talks about them arriving at Mala, cutting a path through, through the breadfruit forest, laying down uh, Ili Ili, laying down Lao Hala mats, and burying her there, actually right about over here. Yeah? And eventually at the Moku'ula, and eventually possibly the Christian church. 
Okay, so kukule apuni, oop. A path to save Hawaii's independence, kumu kanavai constitution. We need a constitution. So, kumu kanavai lua ehu 1840. Literally, on this property was where the first constitution for the kingdom of Hawaii was created. Yeah, 1840. And again, a voluntary thing. It wasn't that the people rose up and demanded the king to do this. It wasn't that they rebelled and were kind of cut his head off. He was smart enough, forethinking enough, to create a constitution in 1840. Oh. Okay. From absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy, we have an executive branch, we have a legislative branch, and we have a judicial branch. One more side note about history and progressive, progressivism in Hawaii and so forth. Um, I saw on TV the day the celebration in Honolulu of the first woman uh, Supreme Court justice in America. And it was in 1980 something, 87 or something like that, 89 or something like that. And I was like, well, 140 years prior to that, Hawaii had a woman Supreme Court justice, right? Because in that judiciary that Kaui Kioli created, yeah, there was a woman Hawaiian Supreme Court justice, right? Women had power as governors, as Supreme Court justices, and so forth in the kingdom of Hawaii in 1840. You can make the argument that women lost a lot of power with the coming of democracy to Hawaii. Um, petition against, okay, so this is an interesting piece. Um, and I use it because it was shown to me 15 years ago by an, by, uh, by an unnamed kumu. And, um, and it was that, look, look, so this is a, a petition from Lahaina arguing against Haolian government. And it says, it's signed by, it just says at the bottom, 1,600 people, which, you know, maybe it was 1,600, maybe it, we don't know, we don't have the actual petition. But nonetheless, this is a petition from the people to the king saying, stop putting Haole in the government. And so I was taught, look, yeah, that's awesome. Da -da -da. Hawaiians did this, they demanded no Haole in the government, but the king, Kawikioli, and the other kings, because of class, because they wanted power, said, no, screw you, we're making it how we want to make it, and so forth. So I was kind of taught how this class system of the king versus the people happened. But the people, the Maka'inana, were really the ones pushing for getting rid of the Haole. Now that's before we started to understand things like the Reverend William Richards resigned the mission to help Kawikioli, helped write the first constitution, with William, and went around the world with Timoteo Ha'alaleo to achieve Hawaiian recognition in 1843. So what this, Kawiki only receives this, writes back to the people and says, trust me, trust me, we need to do this. There are no lawyers in Hawaii. There are no, there are no you know, uh, uh, international rights people and so forth in the 1830s. But we need to build a kingdom that will be recognized by the West. So he makes that argument to his people to trust me. Yeah? And he achieves this goal in 1843. It's a different way to look at that document. A path to save Hawaii's independence, Ho'omao uh, Popoea, yeah? So, we're looking for recognition. Uh, this is a kind of a drawing of Ha'olio and Richards in London. Um, they both leave. This is uh, the original of the Mo'i Kawikioli of the Hawaiian Kingdom to the King Louis Philippe of France in April of 1842. This is the actual diplomatic commission of Ha'olio and Richards. So he writes the King of France and says, these two guys are the guys that have the power to negotiate with, for me. Yeah? Um, an impossible mission, right? Now, if you read Ha'olio stuff, Kau Isai is the unquestioned expert on Ha'olio in my mind. Uh, she's done 30 or 40 years of research in, on Ha'olio. Um, but the letters that come from him, they took a ship. Now, they, they had to keep this mission kind of quiet so that no one would kind of try to grab Hawaii before they achieved recognition. And so Ha'olio and Richards take a, a ship down to Mazatlan, Mexico, and they cross Mexico by foot and by burrow and by train for months. And he writes about, we swam across this river, and we went through this jungle, we did this, and these, so this Hawaiian and, and Reverend Richards cross Mexico and arrive in Veracruz, and then take a ship from Veracruz up to Washington, New York and then Washington, right? From there, they meet with the President of the United States, and, uh, who says basically, well, yeah, you know, I, I could do that, but I, I don't want to go out on a limb and make it official yet, so I, I'm not sure. So they leave Washington, they go to London, they go to Paris, and there in London they're able to secure recognition from the French and the English in that 1843 Anglo-French Declaration. Really, a, a, a truly amazing, amazing feat. Ha'olio writes a letter back home to his mom who lived in Kolao, 
and he's, it's, an, it's a tear-jerking letter, and he says, how, well, and he says how, I didn't want this mission. I wish it wouldn't have been asked of me because I'm not worthy of doing this, but I'm serving my nation as I, as I think I should. I miss you. He hasn't seen his mom in two years. And he says, I can't wait to come back to your loving embrace. And unfortunately, he dies at sea on his way home. So the body of Ha'alaleo arrives in Honolulu, and they bury him there at Pohukaina, on the palace, where the palace grounds are today. So Ha'alaleo becomes the first, the first Hawaiian diplomat becomes kind of one of the first um, truly uh, important folks we should all know about. Yeah. Here is the Anglo-French Declaration. I see it all the time called the Anglo-French Proclamation. There's a slight mistake in that. A proclamation is a singular monarch or something saying something. But when it's dual or, or several countries, it's a declaration, just a small note. So the Anglo-French Declaration of 1843 at the Court of London, that's, the, that's a picture of the original there. That's from the British archives. Okay. Um, mission two. So Kawaikioli tells Ha'alaleo also, so besides seeking recognition, I also want you to try to, uh, to get us a kingdom seal, a seal for the kingdom, an official seal. Now these things were highly regulated. You couldn't just make one up. There was one place in the world that, that allowed you to do that, and that was the College of Arms in London. And they would, they would make you a seal. And so Ha'alaleo visits the College of Arms in London in 1843, tells them what he wants, and they create a seal for the Hawaiian kingdom. So I'm gonna show you a picture of the first Hawaiian seal. It's a little bit odd. Come on. So, okay, so it looks kind of like what we see today. But first of all, the guys look kind of Irish. <laughs> and the pu'olo'olo, they're actually daisies, yeah? They're actually flowers. But, you know, they came close. So, so they give this to Ha'alaleo, he takes it home, and Kawikili says, no, no, no. Um, but they, they use that to create the, the, the Hawaiian Kingdom seal two years later. It becomes the real seal. It's changed a couple th more times later by Kalakaua and others. The, the men are facing out at one point and so forth. But that, this is the first. This, we got, this is the original painting from 1844 from the College of Arms in London. It's at the State Archives. Oh, go back. Huh? Tell me. Okay. So, Hawaiian Kingdom, one of the progressive, most progressive, literate, engaged nations in the world. Let me show you how. 1852, Kumu Kanavai, universal manhood suffrage. We mentioned this. Yeah? How many now? We, we're, we're, we've been pushing for quite a while, and there's a, there's a bill passing through the legislature right now, not this moment, but the, in these last few days, to make La Koko a state holiday. Yeah? Um, and it's about awareness. You know, it's about awareness. It's about creating that new master narrative. It's about saying, well, when... when 200,000 kids go home from school, they're gonna ask why. Well, because of La Kua Kua, you tell them and so forth, right? But the same, thing, the same thing with this. How many folks in the US, how many visitors do you think, know that simple fact? That in 1852, if a slave escaped from his master in Alabama, he could come to Hawaii and vote and own property and be a citizen. Yeah? Yeah? So these are the types of narratives that challenge that master narrative of, well, Hawaiians were this way and so forth. And it's, and it's internalized, yeah. It's not just folks talking about Hawaiians. Uh, another quick little story. I lived in Palolo as a grad student with, with my daughter in, in a wonderful home, uh, Mrs. Nobriga, uh, half Hawaiian, half Portuguese. Wonderful lady. She rented us out a little room. And um, she thought it was, she got a tickle out of the fact that this kid in her house was studying Hawaiian stuff. She spoke fluent Hawaiian, or her parents spoke fluent Hawaiian and she didn't speak a word. She was of that generation that you weren't supposed to speak Hawaiian and so forth. And so she, every time I come home, she'd ask me what was going on. I took her, I invited her to a PhD uh, dissertation defense by a friend of mine, Kimo Armitrage. He's Hawaiian, he's an author, published 17, 18 different books, an amazing author. And he was getting his PhD in literature, in, in, literature, in English, I think. And so we come, and she, we, Luau and had Kamakaku, and all, everything's going great. I introduce them. He's very light skinned, maybe even lighter than myself. And so later, I'm talking to her, I'm saying, Anthony, how about that guy? And she's, oh, that's one smart Howley boy. And I'm like, no, Anthony, he's Hawaiian. And she said to me, literally, she said, Hawaiian, get a PhD. You know, you know and it wasn't, yeah, it was sad. She, she really was questioning, like, oh my God, a Hawaiian got a PhD? That comes from this, yeah? That comes from this. Um, those are the types of master narratives that we need to get these types of facts out to challenge. Okay? This is the proclamation in 1854 of neutrality in the Crimean War. 
Be it known to all whom it may concern that we, Kamehameha III, King of the Hawaiian Islands, hereby proclaim our entire neutrality in the war now impending between the great maritime powers of Europe. A Hawaiian monarch, right? Started that discussion about what became international law on neutrality. 1856 Declaration of Paris, an international agreement codifying the laws of neutrality, came out of developments made in the principles of international law on neutrality since the Hawaiian Kingdom's 1854 proclamation. Oh, not oh, wow. education, right? The quote that I saw is in the back of the back, a wonderful quote. Right? Oh, chiefs and commoners, mine is a kingdom of literacy, and the righteous and learned man is my subject. This is from Kawiki Oli, early on, saying, that's our path forward, is education. Yeah? Lionel Luna Mission Seminary, 1831. In 1841, Ahahui Ini Nameha Kahiko o Hawaii Ne was created, the first historical society in Hawaii. And it was created with the president of the organization was Kawiki Aoli. He created a historical society. And Reverend Dibble and him met, and they talked about what they wanted and so forth, and they assigned some of these pupils to Mateo Hatlalio, David Malo, Keone Ana, Samuel Manai Kalani Kamakao, and Moku, Albert Moku. They assigned them, go out and gather stories from Yerkupuna. Go out and gather stories about this. Write them down, and so forth. And they assigned each one of them an essay, right? Hatlalio had an essay on Kamehameha I. David Malo was to do Umi. Keone Ana was to do the arrival of the first Haole in Hawaii. Kamakao was to do Kiapialani, and Moku was to do the, uh, the first. Come on, I don't Moku, I can't, I can't even see that part of Lahaina. <laughs> the first coming to Lahaina, right? So the ships, the first ship coming to Lahaina. So um, this society was not only to gather those facts, which, which started this kind of collection of, of, of oral histories into publication, but also was to train them as historians. Right? To train them as historians. You see, Samuel, Manaya Kalani Kamakao, become one of the most famous historians. Right? So Kawikioli didn't just say, I want a nation of literacy. He went out and, and made sure it was getting done. The Hali Pa'i, right? Up at the museum, up at Honolulu, January 1834, the Ramaj Press comes over from Honolulu. In 1834, we have the first printing of Hawaiian newspapers in Hawaii, up the hill at Lahainaluna. Um, these images come from the Bailey House Museum. I want to thank them. These are, they, they were donated semi-recently, a full run of uh, Kalama Hawaii, the first newspaper, uh, and they're in great shape. So these are some of them, along with later newspapers like Nupepokuokuo with the flag and Ko'oya Io. This one on, your, on my right, your left, was, as many of you know, the first printing of a color flag in any newspaper in the world. I mean, I could sit here for half an hour and tell you firsts that happened in Hawaii. And put that in perspective. I mean, we're here, we're kind of, but what if we were in Germany right now? When you're in Hawaii, tiny little speck out in the Pacific. And this wasn't the king of France, the king of England, the queen of Spain. This was a Hawaiian monarch that was the first to travel around the globe. This was a Hawaiian monarch who had electricity installed at the palace before the White House, and so forth and so forth and so forth. This was a group of Hawaiians, young Hawaiian men, who printed a flag in the newspaper in color that was the first color flag in any newspaper in the world, right? And they had to print, they made a little wood block of the red, and they pressed that, and, they, and the blue, and pressed that, and then they put the black stuff down and pressed that, and they did that 3,000 times. <laughs> and they passed the newspaper around town. So that's the type of stuff, that's the type of innovation, that's the type of education that they're getting. Oh, go back one, okay. Um, did I, did I, got Malo? Oh, no, okay. Um, a slide that I forgot to put in. <laughs> uh, I wanted to show you um, a couple of other things about education. In 1831, there was a new book on geography written um, by the you know, most intelligent guy in geography in the world, and, he, and it was published in New York, and it became the, the, four, you know, the, the new geography, how to study geography. That was translated into Hawaiian by one of the students at Lahaina Luna and used in 1834, three years later. And I read it, and I'm going, oh my. I couldn't understand. It's like, when you're standing at the prime meridian and looking towards Glasgow, Scotland, what is the blah, 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 blah? Hawaiian kids were doing this in 1834. Learning about the prime meridian, learning about this and so forth, right? David Malo printed an atlas, drew an atlas of the world in 1832, right? Uh, the education that existed in Hawaii at the time was, was far-reaching. 
Um, okay, Uahala, 15 December 1854, 11.45. I don't know why I've got a picture of a bicycle thing there. <laughs> um, uh, 1854, 11.45 a.m. at the palace, the, the high kalaunu were struck, the bells of the church were rung, and a 41-gun salute from the fort happened. So immediately afterwards, we see the reaction to his death, right? In the Kuka uh, Kuka Malu in the Privy Council, um, this is from 18 December 1854, it's decided that the days of mourning shall be 90 and not the traditional 30. 90 and not the traditional 30, yeah? Um, a letter of condolence, this is an original letter of condolence held at the State Archives, uh, of the U.S. President Franklin Pierce to Mo'i Alexander Liho Liho, giving his condolences for the death of Kawiki Oli, who he calls a just and righteous ruler. Yeah, this is from President um, Pierce. We've got dozens of these, I just put out a few. This one is from Tsar Alexander II, it should be, of Russia, to, to Mo'i Alexander Liho Liho, giving his condolences again for the death of Kawiki Oli. Um, this story is one that I kind of, so of all the condolences, of all the kind of honors that he was given, this is the one that kind of got me, and I want to read it to you. I wrote it down. It's from the newspaper, from 19 February 1857. When the remains of our late beloved king, Kamehameha III, were deposited in the sepulcher, many were the sad, many were the sad mourners who watched night and day, lamenting and heart-rending, wailing the death of their king, friend, and benefactor. Weeks wore on, and human grief was moderated, if not assuaged. The mourners quietly departed and returned to their homes and occupations. Not so for the late king's favorite mastiff. When the body was deposited in its last resting place, Evelina took his station outside the door of the tomb, the Kamehameha III's favorite dog. And there commenced his weary watch. For many weeks he would not leave the spot, after a time, food was not taken to him, and at last, driven by hunger and thirst, he was compelled to leave. But having satisfied these wants, he returned to his post, and has thus kept watch for nearly two years. Of late, his keepers have tried to confine him, but he is frequently missing, and if searched for, will be found guarding the mortal remains of him he loved so well. Wow. Yeah? So Kawikili's dog sat on his, the doorstep of his tomb for two years. Yeah. Well, that was a t touching one. Um, May a whole memorials, remembrances. Yeah. Now, there's a great line in, in a book I was reading in, in a museum studies course I took that said memorials erase as much history as they create. Right? You place something somewhere and it gets rid of that old whatever was there before. I, I'm writing a paper currently on the. Uh, U.S. War Memorial, Arizona Memorial at Pearl Harbor, talking about how this very honorific, and I have great respect for the men who lost their lives there, but the creation of a U.S. War Memorial at Pearl Harbor eliminates everything that thing was before. The creation, what's the largest statue, memorial statue that we have in Hawaii, outside of the Kamehameha I statue? President William McKinley in downtown Honolulu. So we have a 40-foot bronze statue of President William McKinley in Honolulu. Um, when Kawikioli died, they were trying to create a memorial for him. This is from the Polynesian, 1855. An association was created to honor the memory of Mo'i Kawikioli, Prince Lot Kamehameha, chosen as the president of the association. Um, nothing happens until 1864. Uh, a new push to, to create a memorial, a statue for Kawikioli comes out. Now, following the Constitution of 1864, is an appropriate time to honor him and what he left the Constitution of 1852, a bronze equestrian statue set on a pedestal. pedestal. And this is, was kind of funny. For me. It says, cost would be five or six thousand dollars. You know what the statue that cost them that they just put in Thomas Square Park? A quarter of a million dollars. Could have got a deal back then. They just put it up back then. Five or six thousand dollars. But it, but it doesn't happen. Um, boom. Oops, there we go. Uh, holiday, as a holiday. March 17th as a national holiday. So these were circulars that went out to all the councilates around the world. Remember, 136 councilates, or Hawaiian Kingdom councilates around the world. On every continent, except Antarctica. <laughs> we had councilates in South Africa, in Chile, in Detroit, Michigan, in San Diego, 
all over the world. And they went, these things went out saying, I have the honor to inform you on the Monday, the 17th instant, being the anniversary of the birthday of Kamehameha III, will be observed as a national holiday. The Hawaiian flag will be displayed on all government buildings and the usual salutes will be fired. So this is informing the council that's around the world. This is the 100th anniversary of Kawaikioli's birth. Uh, they had a special uh, memorial service at Kawai Ha'o Church attended by Her Majesty Queen Lili'uokalani. Um, they had a marble, uh, they had a, a um, stone plaque made yeah, uh, that was covered by the Queen's High Kalaunu, her, her royal standard. And she unveiled the commemorative tablet. Um, mm -mm. Oh, go back. Oh. Sorry, I'm stumbling with this. One second, there we go. Okay, who? Oh. Come on. Boom. There we go. Fred Kahapula Beckley and Albert um, Hopili were the spear bearers representing Kamea Moku and Kamanava. Yeah? So Fred Beckley from Molokai and Albert Hopili were the spear bearers representing the twins. There's the actual memorial. Yeah? Um, these are some oops, these are some photographs. I didn't do that. I promise. <laughs> these are some actual photographs of the, bringing the memorial out to Ko, to Kona. Yeah. That's not me. Okay, I'll do it by hand. Okay, we've that that one. And then there's them arriving with the tablet. Marching it. So this is 1914. Marching it. The man who built a nation. So, no one no kalaha. So I want to finish up, and, and hopefully we'll have time for questions because that's the best part because I can find out what you guys are interested in. Um, but I want to finish up with that narrative of identity, right? Um, and tie it into something. Uh, that Anohea said, and that was this idea of um, finding similarities and finding justice and, and, and killing the message, not the messenger, right? Uh, killing hate, um, not killing the hater, right? Um, this statue was put in Thomas Square Park uh, last year. These are kids from, from uh, KS that, that, that are there. Um, and it, for me, it claims space. It claims physical space on the landscape when you go by there now, you know, they're turning Kakako into this whatever development and so forth. But you can't help but see that statue when you head down there, right? So it's claiming space there, and it's claiming space in people's minds, right? I was in Hilo a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and I was walking downtown, and on the, I'm not, in, I'm not encouraging folks to do this, <laughs> this is graffiti, but on the electric box in downtown Hilo, there's a big, there's a Kawikoli uh, image somebody painted on the, you know. And I had to stop, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, Ka that's Kalakawa, right? And it's just that idea of claiming space, claiming space in the kids' minds, in the schools, you know, on the walls. Um, every March 17th, there should be a celebration for Kawikioli in all the schools, yeah? Did you know that Eva School, did you know this, that to, to this day, Eva School celebrates Abraham Lincoln Day, and the kids write a song and say, we want to be just like you, yeah? Are there no Hawaiian heroes, right? So it's claiming space on that narrative. Uh, it's demanding to know the real history. Um, so I encourage everyone to, to follow that example that Kawikioli set, right? Push for education. Push for an enlightened nation once again, right? Because the more we do that, it doesn't matter. To me, it's not a political move. It's a move about justice, about humanity. When you tell your story, and you tell your story, and you tell your story, that gives us context for us all to understand how we're gonna create a world that we all wanna live in, right? It's that engagement with history and the past because our future is in our past, yeah? Mahalo.